I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful for your presence. We'd like to invite you back to any of our other services that you can attend. We uh, meet on, at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning for Bible class, 10 o'clock Sunday morning for worship. Again, on Sunday evening at, here at 6 o'clock and on Wednesday for our midweek Bible study at 7. On our prayer list this week, we have Randy Free, who had a heart cath put in this past Wednesday. And after he recovers from that uh, procedure, he will have another one done uh, afterwards. Let us also please remember Sally Beach, Mona Coates, Mike Crosby, Bob Jernigan, Bonnie Joyner, Bob Kuhn, Ron Toothman, Jill Valdez, and all of those of our number that are shut in. Our sympathy is extended to Nancy Rowan on the passing of her sister uh, this last week on Wednesday. Um, she suffered from a brain aneurysm and uh, she was laid to rest yesterday in Ocala. Uh, please help keep our kids encouraged from grades 2 through 12 as we launched our uh, Bible Bowl uh, class uh, again this year. If you remember last year it was canceled due to COVID, so we're getting back on track with that. So uh, if you want to be studying with us, we're going to be studying the book of Acts. We will have a dinner to both honor our last leaders participants and to have meet and greet with our potential youth minister Ryan Smallwood on Saturday, April 17th at 6 p.m. Mike Rich will be catering this event for us and everyone in the congregation is invited to come and meet Ryan and to congratulate all of our students and last leaders participants. Please sign the sheet in the hallway if you plan on attending. That way we can have an accurate count in preparation for the food. The house to house heart to heart brochures on the foyer table are new, so please take some of those and pass them out to your co-workers and neighbors. The pantry item for this week are Pop-Tarts and fruit juices. Please pick up some extra while you're out shopping to help keep the pantry stocked. If you're unable to do so, you can still give Wally uh, money and he can uh, buy what we need to keep that stocked up. Please continue to check the, this week's bulletin and the bulletin boards around the building for other up upcoming events and activities that aren't mentioned here this evening. There are no additional announcements at this time from our elders. We'll begin our worship service.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we most humbly come in front of you, Father. And Father, we appreciate the things that you have given us in our lives, Father. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you and your Son tonight, Father. And Father, we ask that you be with our congregation as we uh, uh, strive to get back to normal, and we strive to get everybody back here, Father. We ask that you be with uh, our uh, leaders, that they'll have a uh, the foresight and the knowledge to do what's right for this congregation, Father. And Father, we thank you for TJ and his family and bringing him here for us, Father. And Father, we ask that you be with uh, Brother Smallwood as he's uh, wanting to come here, that if he's a good fit, Father, that uh, you will know. Father, we ask that we go out into our community, Father, and be examples to people that we meet, that we may... Uh, build relationships that uh, will come to lead people to Christ, Father. And Father, we ask that you be with uh, the ones that's been mentioned that's sick, especially uh, for Michael Crosby and, and uh, Bob Jernigan, be with Nancy and his family. And Father, all the ones that was mentioned that I forget, and just be with them, let us uh, care for them and let them know that we care about them, Father. And Father, we pray for our children that they'll grow up and find suitable mates, that they'll uh, find Christian mates, Father, and we pray for them, uh, that they'll always remain faithful. And we thank you for uh, Valencia and, and uh, uh, her husband <laughs> and, uh, and the Lads Leaders Program, Father, and we thank you for Tony for taking on the Bible Bowl uh, and let, it, let us participate in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Real quick notes, speaking of leadership, wanted to uh, send a uh, special thanks to uh, Ryland and Xander who are operating the booth tonight. Uh, if you've been watching the YouTube channels and so on and so forth, you've seen their influence. They've stepped up and uh, uh, learned the new programs, which for some adults were
morning. Hope you've had a good day. It started off to be a gloomy day, and I'll confess to you and say that uh, I was the one preaching, and I was somewhat drowsy this morning. And so if I looked out at the audience and saw a few people nodding off, which I don't remember seeing that, and for future reference, if you do that, you don't have to come and confess that to me. There's a real good chance I didn't see you. Uh, <laughs> most weeks, somebody will say, Preacher, I'm sorry that I dozed off for a minute and you less, and I'm taking medicine, or I stayed up late last night. And nine times out of ten, I just don't notice it. But uh, this morning, I sympathize with you because I don't know what it was, but I was uh, the first time that I can ever remember. I almost fell asleep in an elders and deacons and preachers meeting, and I almost fell asleep uh, preaching, it seemed. And so uh, the good thing about gloomy days is that the sun will always come out at some point later. And uh, we do have some sunshine this evening, and it's good to see both the rain and the sunshine, whatever God will give us. Um, appreciate you being here. I know I say that and, and it isn't uh, to be taken lightly. I know that you can tell a lot about a person by how they spend their time. And the fact that you've chosen to be here to worship with us and to study with us this evening says a lot about your interest in this life. And I appreciate you being interested in spiritual matters. I made you a promise this morning. We talked about uh, the promises of God. And I gave you three promises that I thought were great promises of God. That is, God's promise to send a Savior, He delivered on that promise. God's promise to establish His kingdom, that is, build His church, and He also delivered on that promise. And His promise to all of us that at some point in the future, He will come again and take us to that prepared home in the sky, in heaven above. And we have no reason to doubt that particular promise. Uh, this evening, what I, or what I promised you this morning we would talk about this evening is that we would look at the promises of God continued, but this time from the perspective of promises that are meant to encourage us. Now here's the reality of life, and maybe this is something you can't relate to at this present moment, but there's a good chance that at some point in your past or at some point in the future, you have gone through difficulties. You have, you have gone through gloomy days, that is, metaphorically speaking. You have gone through moments in your life where, you're, where tears fall and the heart aches and sorrow exists. And maybe you're going through moments like that right now. And if that is the case, I pray that the Scripture that is shared... Uh, will be of some encouragement to you. And if maybe everything's just going splendid in your life right now, please tuck this message and others like it away and save it for those gloomy days because it is worth remembering when we feel as though all hope is lost. Yeah, I want to reference a passage we talked about this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And the Bible says concerning the promises of God, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This evening I want to offer you five promises that God has made to us Christians that encourage us or, or are meant to encourage us. The first one is taken from Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. Now, we all probably know that Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is a familiar passage. Because in Matthew 18, or rather Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, we have what we call the Great Commission. And, and yes, we could turn to this passage and talk about our responsibility to, to, to spreading the gospel and teaching all nations and baptizing them and making disciples. And certainly all of that is found in the text. But in the midst of all of that, he says something in verse number 20 that catches my attention. He says, "...teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you." Here's the promise. And lo, Jesus says, to all disciples, specifically to those of that day, but to all disciples of all future time, He says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now keep in mind how important these words were for those who were standing with Him on this occasion. Standing with Him on this occasion were the apostles and men like Peter and John, and, and we could go down the list of all of the apostles, it seems that possibly all of the apostles, with the exception of John, became martyrs for the cause of Christ. 
And he, these are men that will be threatened and they will be beaten and many of them will be imprisoned and some of them will be exiled all because they were going to fulfill this great commission or, or, or go about the responsibility that he has laid out here. And, and Jesus says, go. And there's a number of points to be made as I've already said. Number one, Jesus says in verse 18 that I have all authority. And it's of interest that he says, I have all authority both in heaven and on earth. And the idea, of course, being conveyed is that the authority of Christ extends to both heaven and earth. Therefore, what he says in any matter is final. There's a period at the end of it that Jesus said it, that settles it. And yet this is important in light of what Jesus would say in John 12 and verse 48 when He said that the words that I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. The words that Jesus has spoken, the words found in the Bible, we will all be held accountable for how we have lived according to that on that final day. The second point in this passage is Him, him dealing out this responsibility. And this responsibility, of course, was to His apostles, but it's to you and it's to me and it's to all followers of Jesus that would come thereafter. And the responsibility, of course, is, is Christ gives the commission to go and teach, number one. Number two, baptize. And number three, make disciples of all nations. Don't, don't be prejudiced. Don't limit it to people who look like us and talk like us and, and were raised like us. And then the third point, the one that I think is of most interest here regarding the promises of God, is that if you, as you go out and put yourself in harm's way to preach the name of Christ, as you go out and try to convert people to the cause of Christ, you're going to come across many obstacles and many challenges and maybe many uh, persecutions and, and you will make enemies. And in the midst of all of the responsibility that God puts upon us, He says, don't ever let Satan convince you that you're doing it alone. Don't ever let Satan make you feel lonely and isolated. Don't ever let him convince you that you do not have anyone there for support. Because Jesus says, if you go about doing this, being a true disciple of mine, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, is the way he would put it in another passage. He says, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so the application is pretty simple. Sometimes in life we feel isolated, we feel all alone. In moments of sadness and depression and weakness, we can feel alone. No doubt we've all been there. Take comfort. May we all take comfort from the words of Christ, the, the promise of Jesus here in this passage that He will always be there for us no matter how dark the day is or how lonely the road is. You know, I've referenced it several times, but I still keep thinking of that uh, famous uh, portrait with the poem of the footprints in the sand. And you know the, the gist of that, how that there's two prints of sand in, in the sand representing the individual and representing Jesus walking by his side. And then when the, the storm came and things got tough, he saw one set of footprints and he concluded and even challenged Jesus. Jesus, why when things got rough did you leave me? And he says, dear son, I didn't leave you, but in those moments I picked you up and I bore your burden and I was there for you. And the one foot of footprints that you see or the one set of footprints you see is my footprints carrying you. Don't forget that Jesus has promised us that He will be with us always. And may we take that to the bank. Point number two is found in Philippians chapter 4. Will you turn there with me please? In Philippians chapter 4, there's two points here I want to derive from Philippians 4. And the first one is found in verse number 7. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I, I often get uh, feedback regarding my lessons from my wife, and she recently told me, you need to, you need to repeat the Bible verses twice, because I can't seem to ever write all of them down. So here we go, Philippians 4 verse 7. Philippians 4 verse 7. Okay, there you go. Here the Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 7, in Philippians 4, 7, the Bible says, <laughs> here's what Jesus says, or here's what God says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That verse means something to me, folks. 
I don't know how to communicate the feelings and the thoughts that I have in my mind right now, but I don't know if you can relate to this. If you can't, I'm sorry. But there have been moments in my life where I don't feel at peace on the inside. There have been moments in my life where I've thought, what's the problem? Do I have too much on my plate? Am I too hard on myself? Am I getting stressed out over things that don't matter? Do I have a condition like anxiety? There have been times in my life I've legitimately wondered, TJ, what's the problem? How come you're always uncomfortable despite the enormous amount of blessings in your life? And what I am convinced of is that this is a rather common problem in the world at large that people do not have peace and people do not have that inner calmness and tranquility, which is really what peace is. It is an inner calmness that, that despite the storm that is raging on the outside, we experience this calmness in Christ on the inside. And so he comments on peace here. Point number two is that he, God, will give us peace that surpasses all human understanding. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. Three observations. Number one, uh, true peace, which again is inner calmness, tranquility, tranquility, comes from God and it is given through Jesus Christ. Do you see that in the text? True peace, now, now we can make any number of observations. True peace, this inner calmness, it cannot be found on a, uh, in a bookstore in the self-help section alone, Okay? This true peace and inner calmness that we are seeking and, and the world is seeking, it is something that cannot be found in riches, materialism. It is something that cannot be found in many of the areas we often look in. And of course, we do live in a chaotic world. And, and, and people try to find this peace by reading self-help books or by having a daily meditation. That's popular nowadays. I happen to do it myself. Some people even try to accomplish this through breathing exercises. Or some people seek out religions that have the reputation of giving peace, like let's say Buddhism, and yet they're trying to find peace in all the wrong places. If inner calmness is what we really want, we need to look no further than Jesus Christ. Do you see that there in the text? Philippians 4 verse 7 again. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. And where is it given? It's given by God, the peace of God, the end of the verse, and it's given through Jesus Christ. Now that's observation number one. Observation number two, this type of peace transcends, surpasses, is greater than natural human understanding and experience. Now what I mean by that is that when we live in this life and we think we have a good concept of what peace is, the peace that comes as a result of following God and submitting to His will is superior, it surpasses, it transcends the peace that the world thinks that they have obtained. And, and that type of peace is true peace. It is the greatest type of peace. And observation number three is that this type of peace, underline it, will guard... That is, it will protect our hearts and our minds. I'm convinced that, that oftentimes we are our own worst enemy. I'm convinced of that. I don't know how you want to describe it. Some people say we all have inner demons that we fight. We, we, we may have no reason whatsoever to doubt that, that we are loved by God or doubt that, that we are worth something to God or doubt that others in our life care about us. But have you experienced that inner voice that says, God really doesn't love you. You're more of a burden on people than you are a blessing. They're not really your friends. Have you, we've all experienced those inner voices, haven't we? And I suggest to you that that is what people are trying to get rid of. And that's what people want to put in play, or that is what pe that's why people want peace, is to see those type of negative thoughts gotten rid of. And yet in this passage, the Bible says the peace that comes from God and given through Jesus Christ, it will guard, it will protect, it will set up a wall, and it will guard our hearts and our minds. And so the peace... Early in my preaching, I probably wouldn't have been preaching on peace a whole lot because I didn't understand it. 
and I didn't appreciate it. And I know that I've not lived very long according to some or in comparison to some, but brothers and sisters, the more I live, the more I desperately know how much I need peace. And it only comes from God through Christ Jesus. In this chaotic and stressful world, many are searching, as I've said, for that inner calmness and tranquility. They, they look in any number of areas that we've already mentioned, but Jesus is where it's found. Point number three, staying here in Philippians chapter 4, this time verse number 19. Point number three, Philippians 4 and verse number 19, the Bible says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. How many nights have you lost sleep over worrying about things that really are beyond your control? I've done that. I don't know what, what keeps you up at night, but sometimes things that are really not even in my control, I've lost sleep over. And like we've studied in a previous lesson, I think that we need as Christians to distinguish between concern and worry. One is understandable, one is destructive, the other is destructive. And here's what the Bible says again in Philippians 4 and verse number 19. He says to begin with, And my God shall supply all your need. Now, keep in mind that it's God who takes care of us. It's God who takes care of our needs. Now, what is our needs? It could be fundamental and basic. It could start with food, clothing, and shelter. It could be the connection we seek and want with other people, friendships and the like. It, it, it can be positive social interactions. It can be a, a larger church family, for instance. It could be a support system. It could be a listening ear for when we just want to talk and get things off our chest. Whatever it is that we need in this life, the Bible says God will supply that for us. We don't really need to spend our time worrying about it. Here's the second observation from Philippians 4.19. This is done according, underline it, according to the riches, that is the wealth, the vastness of His glory. And again, it's done through Jesus Christ. Do you see that there in the text? And so, backing up a minute, the peace that we long for is only found in Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the provisions that God is extending to us is extended to us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can hold your place there where we're not actually coming back to Philippians 4. So turn with me in your Bibles to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse number 25. And you're probably thinking of this passage also. But regarding God providing for us what we need, the Bible says in Matthew 6, beginning Ending at verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on or wear. He says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them, doesn't He? Notice what it says next. Are you not of more value than they, the birds of the air? God concluded after creating humans, not birds, behold, it is very good. God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for you and I, not animals. He values us much greater than He does even the animals that He has created. And if the birds of the air do not have to worry or be greatly concerned with what they will eat, nor should we be overly concerned with it as faithful children of God. He says in verse 27, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? A cubit's 18 inches. Ladies, I don't care how high your high heels are, I don't think you're going to get 18 inches out of it. He says we cannot worry so much that it changes something out of our control. Verse 28, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory are not, was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Verse 31, Therefore do not worry, 
saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles, the heathen, seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Here's the point. God knows better than us what we need. And sometimes what we think we need, God knows that we do not need it. And yet the Bible says in the grand crescendo of this passage, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that you, that you really need will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I don't know about you folks, but I need to hear that sometimes. I need to be reminded that God is in control. He knows my needs and He's there to help supply my needs. And, and that is a promise. And every time God has offered a promise in the past, He's faithfully fulfilled it. And any promise that He offers to us as Christians, His track record speaks for itself. He will fulfill that promise. And so by way of review, number one, He will always be with us. Point number two, He will give us peace that surpasses all human understanding. Point three, He will provide the things that we need. Here's point number four of five, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 54. Will you turn there with me, please? Isaiah 54, verse 17. Point number four is that He will go before us and He will protect us. Here's the reality, we need to be protected. We need to be protected from Satan. We need to be protected from our enemies. We need to be protected for, from ourselves sometimes. And it may seem somewhat obscure, but notice what Isaiah writes. In Isaiah 54, verse 17, he says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Anyone who hates you enough to get a weapon and try to pursue you after with violent intent, whatever that weapon is, however dangerous and scary it seems, if God is there to protect you, that weapon will be rendered useless. That's what he's saying. Keep reading. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Anyone who speaks against us, lies about us, gossips about us, slanders us, says things that, are, that, that is against us, God is there to protect us from the harm that might inevitably come from those moments. And then he continues by saying, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. In short, God will see that we are protected from the forces that seek to do us harm. And ultimately, the greatest force that seeks to do us harm is the devil himself. And remember, this is a passage we read quickly, but bypassed with very little to say about it this morning, but it's first. Corinthians 10 verse 13. If you hear nothing else this evening, I want you to hear this verse. 1 Corinthians 10 13. The Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful. God is faithful in the moment of our temptation who will not allow you and me to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear or able to handle, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. When Joseph was, let's say, being tempted or backed in a corner to sin in the house of Potiphar, God gave him an escape route. And every time we are tempted, and we are tempted as children of God, you may be tempted as soon as you leave service this evening. You are certainly going to be, as I will be as well, tempted throughout the week to forsake God, to sin against God, to commit sin, to abandon my Christian responsibilities, to grow weak and give up. Each and every time we are being tempted, it is our greatest enemy who is pursuing us because he exists for one purpose, and that is to rip us from from the hands of God and for us to be miserable with Him for all eternity. We have a choice in the matter. And we have God who is there to protect us. It's actually one way that He protects us is our Christian family. Rely on one another for love and support. 
Another way He protects us is through His Word. Church family, I know you hear me say it often, but do you remember what the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse number 11? David says, Your Word I have hid in my heart. Why did David say that? What's he say next? That I might not do what? Sin against you. This book right here is God's way of protecting us from the temptations of the devil. Even Jesus utilized that help in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4. And so that's point number four, that He will go before us and He will protect us from that which seeks to do us harm. That's a promise I can take to the bank and have full assurance in. Fifth and final point found in Revelation 21 verse 4. In Revelation 21 verse 4, the Bible reminds me of something that I need reminding of. The Bible says in God, Revelation 21 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, there shall be no more sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. All the things in this life that make us as human beings miserable, those things like tears and death and sorrow and pain, etc., those things in this life that make our human experience miserable at times, God says, you, you, you follow me, you serve me through my son Jesus Christ, one day you'll have a home in heaven and all of those things will be taken away. That is a reminder that I need and it is a promise from the same God who promised to send his son and he did. It is a promise from the same God who promised to establish his kingdom, the church, and he did. The same God who has brought me and you through many hard times. The same God who has seen us through the dark days. The same God who will be with us in those difficulties going forward. And so when I think about the promises of God, I think about the faithfulness of my God. And of course, Peter said it. God is not slack concerning His promises. But he is long suffering toward us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now's the time to make that decision. Will you choose now to repent and come and serve the faithful God that we know and love? We ask you to make that decision right now as we stand and as we sing.
Our Lord and our God, we thank you for you sending your Son to this earth for our sins, Father, for us to be able to have a chance to live with you forever one day. And as those take tonight the bread, help them to remember back to Christ's body hung on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue in prayer. God, we mindful of the blood that your son shed because of us, Father, through the scourging that he took and as he hung there on the cross, Father, and as those take the cup tonight, help them to remember that blood that was shed. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our prayer for the collection. Our God and our Father, we are mindful of all the blessings you've given us, Father. Blessings each day that we take for granted, Father, the air we breathe, water we drink. We are mindful also of the means for us to be able to live a life of luxury, Father. We know that all those come from you, Father. And as we're mindful of that, we ask that you help us to be able to give back to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been good to be here today and to worship with you. I hope you feel the same way. Uh, we hope that each of you have a good week to come. Uh, let me tell you, and I think you already know this, but let me tell you, I'm extremely excited that uh, for a number of things on the horizon here at the Lake City Church of Christ, one of the things that's happening very soon is for us to get a chance to meet uh, Ryan Smallwood and Angela and their three kids. <clears throat> I think I mentioned to you before that we personally know this family. Uh, they were attending with us when he was in the Marines and I was preaching in St. Mary's, Georgia, there in that naval community. And to see them grow through the years and him go to Freed Hardeman and get his master's degree and get into ministry and work with kids, it's wonderful that they have the opportunity to come here and meet this congregation because we both love them and love this congregation. And uh, we're excited about the potential opportunity that is ahead. And so let me just say this, that uh, if you at all, if you have any chance whatsoever to be here with us Saturday evening at 6 o'clock, come and do that. Uh, we'd love for you to get to meet them, for them to get to meet you. And it's a big decision because this is a youth minister position, a family of five potentially. Uh, it's a big decision for our elders. And so come and meet them. Give them your feedback so that they can make a more informed decision in this process. Uh, that's at 6 o'clock on Saturday. But I'm also excited to show these Lads to Leaders, uh, uh, young people who participate in Lads to Leaders, that, that we love and support them in all of their accomplishments. So that will be a meal prepared. Uh, it will not be like a potluck. It will be a meal that is prepared by, by Mike and Brenda. So they need to know how much food to prepare. If you will, sign that sheet in the back. That will give them a better idea of how many is coming. Um, let me also say that uh, we will be having Wednesday night Bible study here in the building once again at 7 o'clock this Wednesday. We invite you to come be with us. Because we're not having kids classes at the moment, we're going to alter the way that went this past Wednesday. We're going to keep that Bible class to about 20 minutes and have more of a pew packers session for the kids before that. So come and be with us from 7 to about 8 on Wednesday. Also, don't forget our food giveaway on Thursday at 1.30. And Lads to Leaders have sign-up sheets. We're starting early. And I'll also add to all of our young people who are probably, a lot of them, I think, from grade 2 and up are studying for Bible Bowl. This is a wonderful opportunity to better learn a very pivotal book in the New Testament, the book of Acts. Parents, encourage your kids to get to work on that. They're getting a lot of help here at the congregation. We're excited for that as well. Uh, elders, anything we need to mention at this time? All right, we'll be dismissed with a song and a word of prayer. Song number 19, please. Song number 19. And again, this is beautiful for you, please. Just one more song.
Be you bow your head and pray with me, please. Oh Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne to offer up this prayer. Father, we want to thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. The family we have here, as well as our own families. The families, when we reach out into the community, as we do on Thursdays with our food drive, and we touch all of those lives. So many of those people are starting to become our family members as well. We ask you to watch over them, protect them, keep us all safe. Father, we ask you to remember to be with all those that are ill that have been mentioned, and even those that haven't been mentioned, that some of us may know of, to watch over them and protect them, to strengthen them, and to show your love to them. Father, we ask you to be with the men and women who serve in our country, our police, our firefighters. Watch over them and keep them safe. Keep them and return them to their families. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us throughout each day. And we ask, as always, that we continue to serve you. And we ask for this in thy son's most holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.